<laughs> um, thank you so much to UGA's Creative Writing Program, which is co-sponsoring the event with the Institute of African American Studies. Um, their help was instrumental in making this event happen. Um, and thank you to Christine, Le Christine Lasek, who couldn't be here tonight, who did a great job with promo. Um, let's see, Avid Bookshop, the greatest, world's greatest, maybe, we don't know yet, but they are here with copies of um, Masande Changa's The Reactive for you to purchase and perhaps have signed and sleep um, with under your pillow so you can absorb it as you dream in addition to reading it in your waking hours. So just keep that in mind. First up, we have my friend and yours, Gabriel Hovinden. Gabriel Hovinden's writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the Missouri Review, Gettysburg Review, Cincinnati Review, Verse, Redivider, Day One, and Ninth Letter. She is the recipient of a Vermont Studio Center Fellowship, a Richard Devine Fellowship, and a Lilly Fellows Graduate Program Scholarship. She lives and teaches in Athens, Georgia. Please welcome Gabe's. Hey guys, thanks so much for being here. Thanks to Ms. Sunday for being with us. Um, I'm going to read from the beginnings of two short stories today, a couple minutes from each, um, both of which I wrote kind of in the year after I left my MFA in Ohio, um, and both of which are about art and religion and kind of unhealthy obsession, uh, some of my favorite things. Um, so this first one is called A Quiet Pilgrimage to Every Last Ruined Saint, um, and it's about two young artists in Bulgaria, a boy and a girl, who meet and become best friends. We meet throwing rocks at the Shkola 837, and right away I know we'll be friends. Zhivka has a terrible overhand, but an angry set to her jaw that makes me step back and watch. A stone sails whitely through the air and connects with glass, and then she goes for another. The window shatters. We're 13 years old, artists in the making. Failure running through our lives like a rabbit thread. We become inseparable almost immediately. We break into gardens and climb the black cherry trees and shake down handfuls of fruit. We walk past the Shkola 837 and smell the sharp fumes of paint wafting out and assure ourselves that we're not jealous, not even a little. We run half feral through the streets and we make plans to start our own studios and art schools. We may have been born into shit, but we won't stay here forever. This is Spasiavain. Grim housing blocks and highways that sling around mountains towards nowhere in particular. We grew up surrounded by broken glass and concrete, a post-Soviet pre-apocalypse wasteland. Our parents work in factories or they sell cigarettes and prepaid phones in corner stores or else they drive to the next city over and work at vague government posts. At night they come home and fill the hallways with the blue tick of television. Not Zhivka and me. We're going to make it out. We're dreaming of our first masterpieces because there's nothing else to dream of. Our home lives are disasters, and this is no place for miracles, but we are not going to be like these other people. She is going to be a painter, and I am going to be a woodworker, and together we will become famous. Before Zhivka, I know nothing about art. I've read a few woodworking manuals, and I've made clumsy pipes and crooked hairbrushes, and I've stumbled blindly through projects, chisels in hand. On unlucky days when my father dragged me to church with his red handprint still on my face, I would sit in the pew with hot blood sliding between my teeth and commit the manuals to memory. One, the basic dovetail joint consists of the flare tails and the slender pins. Confitior deo manipitohenshi is distinctus et omnibus sanctus. Two, once properly constructed, the dovetail cannot be twisted or racked or destroyed except by fire. With Shivka by my side, I learned how to be an artist. She teaches me to steal bent hammers and chisels from the scrap heap behind the Shkola 837 and smuggle them home under my jacket. She lives with her grandmother in a single room in block six, and she lets me keep my tools under her bed. She doesn't ask questions about my black eyes, and so I don't ask questions about her parents, who they are, where they've gone. Sometimes your father is a sadist, and sometimes he's a holy bastard, 
and sometimes he's poisoned by the state, and it is never, ever wise to ask too many questions. 14 years old. Zhivka makes me pose nude for a painting. Not like that, she says. I just want to study you. I take off my clothes, and she folds them and places them on the ground. Her grandmother is out on a weekly walk with a baker's widow, the bricklayer's widow, everyone in this town either widowed or widowing, and block six is cool and quiet. I lay down on the bed. Move your arm, she says. I do. I've learned everything I know about painting from watching Zhivka. She scavenges old canvases and brushes from the garbage behind the Shkola 837, scraping the dead paint off the palettes and mis mixing her own pigments in margarine tubs. She makes an easel out of, broken, out of a broken chair, and she barters balls of wool and blackberry canes in exchange for portraits of the local families. She has a merciless stare, and when she turns it on me, I freeze. This is my first time being part of a painting, but it's Zhivka's hundredth or thousandth. She makes portraits of everyone she comes across. Dead Gregory, the local farmer who everyone says has died no fewer than five times, and the beggar woman in the doorway of the abandoned train depot, and the drunk grabbing his crotch outside sped in Nicoli, and a neighbor with 11 children, and a white cat with six toes. Her lips purse while she paints. She studies me, and I study all her little unconscious tics. The squinting, the palette held up to the light, the tip of her tongue poked out of her mouth. She is looking into me or through me or near me, and I feel like something laid out for sale. I feel limp and shining and new and remade. After she finishes my portrait, she won't let me see it. Before her, I didn't know anything else existed. Um, and then I'm going to read a couple minutes from my other story. Um, this next piece is also about painting. It's set in California, mostly 19th century California. Um, and it's based on a real British-American landscape painter named Edwin Deacon, um, and then a fictionalized priest character. Um, and this one is called In Ruin. Inch by inch, Deacon paints the decaying missions. He paints them at sunset when the light is golden and thick, and he paints them at a distance of 20 yards from which he can see every flake and hairline of their ruin. He makes pencil and charcoal drawings to give his hands the feel of each new mission, and at night he uses these exercises to light his campfires. Before he came west, he used to varnish his work in dammer gum and turpentine, but now he packs the paintings barely dry and rides on. If the country is deserted, he hobbles the horse behind a rise or an outbuilding, and he shouts to drive off the birds and the jackrabbits, and then he paints alone. 1824, Father Jaime prays to an empty room. 1769, the Spanish missions of Alta California are begun by the Franciscans, and they are built with stone and lumber and stucco, and their construction does not cease until the 21st is completed in 1823. From San Diego del Alcala in the south to San Francisco de Solano de Sonoma in the mudflats north of San Pablo Bay, the 21 churches and schools and cloisters and gardens line 500 miles of coast. They are built by indentured Chumash, who learn the friar's Spanish and leave behind their cooking pots and seashells and acorn halls. They are aligned with their chapels facing the sun and their workshops and sleeping rooms and kitchens and lavanderias grouped in sloppy squares the builders lacking proper surveying instruments. They are undertaken by holy and unholy men from Spain and from Baja California, and by the time the last is finished, they have already begun to rot away. 1899, Deacon paints meticulously. He records the buzzards and the cactus and the crosses and the ruined carillons against the sky, and he makes dozens of sketches of hitching posts and boulders and sage until he's sure he has them right. He sits and watches without moving until vultures begin to circle above him. Five years ago, he sold his grandfather's pocket watch for paints, but now he has the best supplies money can buy. He has a brush made of a dozen bound rabbit hairs, and one of pure white horse hair, and one of fox fur trimmed to three quarters of an inch. He has a man to stretch his canvases in La Jolla, and he has a framer in Escondido. He uses deep rusts and yellow ochres, and their colors stain his hands, while elsewhere the desert sand settles into the creases of his clothing. It is the summer of 1899, blisteringly hot. 
He is a vagrant with a canvas tent, a horse, and a box of paints. Alone in a vast, dusty wilderness with 18 unfinished canvases and a heartache the size of the desert. 1824. Father Jaime prays. With the rest of the mission sleeping and the gray morning wet on his eyelids and cheeks, he prays. Sometimes he kneels before his shelf with the statue of the Blessed Virgin, but more often he stands at the open window and clasps his hand and lowers his eyes. He prays quietly and his lips are unmoving, and he does not ever seem to expect a response. He prays, one of the other friars once observed, like someone casting a stone into a deep well and walking away without waiting to hear it hit. 1898. In the early days, Deacon painted disasters. With his Japan box of paint and brushes and a millboard under his arm, he set out for the fires and floods and earthquakes and shipwrecks and train derailments and carriage crashes and armory explosions and murders and robberies and hangings and lynchings and otherwise mayhem of Gilded Age Chicago. He hung out on corners near the Tribune offices, or he loitered on the steps of the police precinct, and he waited for word of the next disaster to sell to the newspapers and the broadside printers. He was cheap talent, an eye for hire, one in a thousand struggling artists in a difficult city. He was 32 years old, and he had no life besides painting. Um, and now there's this half scene where he meets a woman who he falls in love with. I'm going to skip that part um, and end here. <laughs> Um, in the end, Deacon would miss all the great disasters of his century. He had not yet arrived in the city when Chicago burned. He was born five decades too late for the earthquake that destroyed the Alta California missions. Krakatoa was halfway across the world. It would be another eight years before San Francisco shook and burned and fell into the harbor. But he had met Sarah, and she would manage to eclipse them all. Sarah, the one true catastrophe of his life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabe. We missed out on that whole catastrophic love, so we're going to have to make sure that story gets out somewhere so we can get all the juicy details. Um, before I begin my official introduction, I want to say that I discovered um, Masande's work by just cruising $2 Radio's website to see what they were going to be publishing soon. Um, because they're a press that I love, I've read many books from them, and I've always been really excited by how, um, by how feisty they were, and by how, um, how they made sort of a fixed ending so intolerable. It was something that I noticed about the press. Um, and then I discovered, I read about the reactive, I looked up um, a short story, of Masande's online that I read. Um, and then I was really excited about this book that's coming out. Book anticipation is such a delicious feeling. Um, I get it with Hollywood films too, but with books, um, you can actually take it home right, right away um, and then live in it for longer than you get to live in a film usually. This is all to say that you should be looking at all your favorite small presses websites and seeing what they are going to publish, who they're publishing that you don't know. Um, it's so easy now to look up someone's work online if you think you might be interested. Um, there are so many brilliant writers coming up through the small press world. Um, and I just wanted to highlight um, how important it is to be engaging with literature that way, to not always pick up authors who you love, but to look into authors who you may love. Masande Changa's debut novel, The Reactive, plays with time like an open wound, not speeding towards a mythologized future, but planning his body in the hazy grief of here and now. Our protagonist, Linda Nathi, traverses Cape Town via cabs and HIV-positive support meetings, sniffing glue with his roommates, selling his anti-retroviral anti drugs. But this is no tired valorization of some drug-fueled mania. Prodding at grief with searching, blurry eyes, Linda Nathi seeks a balm for the guilt that plagues him after the death of his younger brother. 
mirroring the narrative's turn away from linear time, we find ourselves coming out the end of the maze only to find out it's not the end or the middle or the beginning. This open wound of time, of Linda Nathi's regret and South Africa's clunky attempt to address widespread AIDS diagnoses, wavers and bends in the light, engages the characters trapped within it without sending them marching off into the future. One-line paragraphs, often used in novels and essays to punch up the drama of a moment, act here as languid parts of the whole. The novel will surprise you again and again with its ability to render, so rivetingly, the tense absence of answers, the tender braid of time and experience. Masande Changa is the winner of the 2013 Penn International New Voices Award. He was born in East London in 1986 and grew up all over South Africa. He graduated with a degree in film and media and an honors degree in English studies from UCT, where he became a creative writing fellow, completing his master's degree in creative writing under the Mellon Mays Foundation. He received a Fulbright Award and an NRF freestanding master's scholarship. His debut novel, The Reactive, the beautiful pink tome living behind you right now, was first published in 2014 by Penguin Random House and in the United States this year by Two Dollar Radio. Please welcome Masande Changa. Thank you, Tina. Uh, that was incredible. Thanks, Gabe, as well. And thank you guys for coming by. I really appreciate it. Uh, when I was working on this novel some years ago, I actually had no idea, you know, um, after it was done, that I'd be in Athens, Georgia. <laughs> uh, but it's really, it's really been great. Um, I'll be reading from various parts of the book um, instead of kind of giving a linear reading. And part of the reason for that is when I was working on it, um, I did want it to be kind of experimental in essence. Um, so instead of kind of being a linear narrative, it's one that's almost got a single moment that circles inwards. So um, hopefully you'll be able to get that sensation from um, what I read for you tonight. I'll start right at the beginning. Ten years ago, I helped a handful of men take my little brother's life. I wasn't there when it happened, but I told Lutanda where to find them. Earlier that year, my brother and I had made a pact to combine our initiation ceremonies. This was back in 1993. LT was only 17 then. He was broad of shoulder, but known as a wimp, and Gangalis were high. My brother was good looking in a funny way that never helped him any. And like me, he was often quoted bad or useless by the older guys in the neighborhood. LT was bad with girls too. Most of them had decided against us pretty early. I don't know, maybe it's strange that I remember that about him most of all. I suppose my brother was handed the lousy luck of every guy in our family except our dad, who'd thrown us into different wombs one year after the other. We had cousins like that too. All of them dealt a similar hand. In the end, it was winter when Lutanda went to the hills to set things straight for himself. He went up thinking I would follow behind him. It was raining when the bucket took him on its back and drove him up the dirt trail. Inside the camp, they put him in line with a, with a set of boys he shared a classroom with. Then they took out their blades. Afterwards, they nursed him for a week, and he kicked and swore at them for another two. They called him the screamer, they told us later, when we gathered to put him inside the earth. Maybe it was meant with tenderness, I thought. The kind of tenderness men could keep between themselves in the hills. One morning, they said, my brother had failed to make the sounds they'd come to know him for. Lutanda wasn't due out for another two days. The sky had been an empty blue expanse, 
easy on their duties around Ezekiel, and they missed his peculiar fussiness. When they walked into his hut, one after the other, they found a memory instead of the man they were out to make. That was my little brother, LT, dead at 17, and I've never forgotten it was me who put him there. I never went back home after we buried him. This isn't a story about me and my brother from the trans guy, about them dark boys from Mtata or the village of Kokoleni, where my grandmother's bones lie polished and buried next to her ma's. Instead, I want to tell you about what happened to me in Cape Town after Lutando had taken his death. It's where I went to school and tried to make something of myself. It's also where I began to reconsider what my hands had made, and my telling of how it broke won't take us very long. I went to college two times in my life. I might as well begin with how things went for me there. I first attended the university in Ronnebosch, just up the road from the main strip. And when I dropped out of my journalism degree, I enrolled at the Technicon in town, where I got my science diploma and my sickness. I had an equity scholarship. There had been plenty of those to go around for whoever looked the way I did back then. I got through on mostly average grades too, like most of the guys in my class. When the year came to an end, there was a bunch of us who'd file into the fees office again to fill out all the forms required of boys who shared my skin tone. It didn't take much to go to school for free in those days, or rather to trade on the pigment we were given to carry. I think I did all right if you consider everything else, and I graduated with an upper second class pass in the end. I still have that diploma sitting somewhere in my flat and observatory. Now, what else? In between university and tech, I spent close to half a year at Budvoyo's place. Two weeks after dropping out of the university, I tried to go home, but I couldn't set foot inside my mother's house. The home I'd known since I was a child was barred to me. There could have been a tapestry of fire that flowed over each of our walls that day. In fact, thinking about it now, even that feels like an understatement. My mother felt disgraced by my decision to leave the university and my bachelor's degree behind me in Rhonda Bosch. It was too soon, she complained, first over the phone and then again in person. For a few moments, she even refused to turn her face up towards me. Instead, Ma arranged for me to enter the home of a relative. But Voyo was known as a great mechanic, a recovering alcoholic, and someone who'd been a doting stepfather to the little brother I'd helped to kill. He'd met my aunt, Sisfuneka, when Lutanda was only 10 years old. And before then, sticking his hands into rusting bonnets had taken Budvoyo to Okinawa as a man of barely 20. Pushed forward by the locomotive of a lucrative Toyota scholarship, He'd gone to the city of Kyoto at the age of 24 before coming back and accepting too many drinks on the house in a tavern called Silvers. That was in Bisho during the decline of the homeland years and they'd served him on a cloth covered tray every morning after he'd taken his table. It was no more than a month, people said, before my uncle was undone. There were decades that would nearly fell him after that. Budvoyo barely standing on his two feet around the neighborhood, and Budvoyo tottering on street corners next to the highway in Danzane. He was often seen with his toes busting out through the smiles on his black and blue gum boots, his head lolling as wispy as an old hornet's nest over his shoulders. Now, my mother told me, having wrung himself dry, and maybe for good this time, Budvoyo lived with his second wife in Danun. They had two small children and her older son from a previous marriage, all of them born with bright eyes and strong teeth and each glowing with the promise of long lasting health. For her part, my aunt had passed away shortly after we'd buried her son. Sisfunega had had a cancer eating away at her throat and I suppose it had grown too impatient with the rigorous hold of her grief. In the end, it had been a punishment for me to be sent to Danun. I had known that even then. But thinking of my little brother, of Lutando, I'd made myself accept the idea. And so I went to Danun like my mother wanted me to, 
and ended up staying there for six months. I suppose some things happened when I was out there too, and I drew close to those folks who'd taken me in. The subject of Lutana came up as I thought it would, and in my gratitude to them, I made a promise to put Fuyo and his household. Now, close to eight years later, I receive a text message from my uncle that reminds me of the words we shared back then, and not the promise I made. On a night so long ago, I can hardly put it together from memory. This morning, when I opened my eyes, I found another warm Saturday wrapping itself around the peninsula. Someone had left Sissy's living room window open again, the one on the east-facing wall, above the copy of Rothko's number four that she painted for the three of us last week. Standing there in front of the glass, I couldn't tell you which one of us had left the window open, only that when I heard the wind blowing under the wooden sash again, I felt I was on my own here. There was a blanket of smog stretching itself thick over the rim of the metropolis, and everything looked inflated and exhausted all at once. I remembered all the different things inside the city, and how they changed the moment you got used to them. Then I remembered myself too. I closed the window after that, and soon my eyes followed. Now it's a little later. Outside, the sky seems geared up for another humid weekend over the city. Another three days of trees at war with their roots, and of dirty window panes getting stripped clean by the late winter rain. I take a shallow breath, then cough. Where I am right now is Newlands. I'm over at Cecilia's place, and I suppose the situation is easy enough to explain. It's still a long stretch of time before I die, but only three short hours since I received the message from my uncle and everything's happening the way it usually does between me and my friends. Like always, the three of us, that's me, Ruan, and Cecilia, we wake up some time before noon and take two ibuprofens each. Then we go back to sleep, wake up an hour later, and take another two from the 800 milligram pack. Then Sissy turns on the stove to cook up a batch of glue, and the three of us wander around mutely after that digging the sleep out of our eyes and caroming off each other's limbs. We drift through whatever passes for early afternoon here at Sissy's place. The way I got to know them, by the way, my two closest friends here, is that we met at one of the new HIV and drug counseling sessions cropping up all over the city. We were in the basement parking lot of the free clinic in Weinberg. The seminar room upstairs had been locked up and taped shut there'd been a mercury spill, and our group couldn't meet in there on account of the vapors being toxic to human tissue. Instead, they arranged us in the basement parking lot, and in two weeks, we got used to not being sent upstairs for meetings. I did, in any case, and that was enough for me in the beginning. In those days, I attended the meetings alone. I'd catch a taxi from Arbs over to Weinberg for an afternoon's worth of counseling. By the end of my first month, when the seminar room had been swept once, and then twice, and then three times, by a short man who wore a blue contamination meter over his chest, each time checking out clean, everyone decided they preferred it down below, and so that's where we stayed. Maybe we all want to be buried here, I said. It had been the first time I'd spoken in group. Talking always took me a while back then, but the remarks succeeded in making a few of them laugh. It won me chuckles even from the old timers, and later I wrote down my first addiction story to share with the group. It was from a film I saw adapted from a book I wasn't likely to read. Rowan and Sissy arrived on the following Wednesday. I noticed them immediately. Something seemed to draw us in from our first meeting. In the parking lot, we eyeballed each other for a while before we spoke. During the coffee break, we stood by the serving table in front of a peeling Toyota Baki, mumbling tentatively towards each other's profiles. I learned that Cecilia was a teacher. She pulled week-long shifts at a daycare center just off Bridge Street in Mulberry, and she was there on account of the school's accepting its first openly positive pupil. Ruan, who was leaning against the plastic, plastic table, 
gulping more than sipping at the coffee in his paper cup, said that he suffocated through his life by working on the top floor of his uncle's computer firm. He was there to shop for a social issue they could use for their corporate responsibility strategy. He called it CRS, and Sissy and I had to ask him what he meant. In the end, I guess I was impressed. I told them how I used to be a lab assistant at Peninsula Tech, and how, in a way, this was part of how I got to be sick with what I have. When we sat back down again, we listened to the rest of the members assess each other's nightmares. They passed them around with a familiar casualness. Mark knew about Ronell's school fees, for instance, and she knew about Lynette's hepatitis, and all of us knew that Linda had developed a spate of genital warts over September. She called them water warts when she first told us, and, like most of her symptoms, she blamed them on the rain. That day, when the discussion turned to drug abuse, as it always did during the last half hour of our sessions, the three of us had nothing to add. I looked over at Rowan and caught him stashing a grin behind his fist, while on my other side, Cecilia blinked up at the ceiling. I didn't need any more evidence for our kinship. The meeting lasted the full two hours, and when it came to an end, I collected my proof of attendance and exchanged numbers with Ruan and Cecilia. I suppose we said our goodbyes at the entrance of the parking lot that day. And later, within that same week, I think, we were huffing paint thinner together in my flat in Arbs. When I kill the first kid on the rugby field, the first thought that goes through my head, besides having to release the trigger, is that somehow this isn't so bad. I mean, it's awful how the bullet, we're using a clip of half-jacketed hollow points, shatters his skull just above the ear and he falls down, blood splashing and hair fluttering. And I think to myself, after all, Harriet Tubman is also dead. Then Ruan peers over my shoulder, looking down at the blood sinking into the ant-filled grass. Nice headshot, he says to me. Then Sissy takes the gun from my hands and carelessly shoots another kid in the throat. I guess this one would have been the lock in the team. That's how high he jumps. His throat explodes into winglets of flesh, and all three of us have to shut our eyes against the blood. I step forward and say to my friends, I don't know. I say, do you think this will work? Sissy hands me the gun and takes her shoes off. When the green grass spikes between her toes, she smiles, and I guess this is what killing for the government is like. The gun is slicked all over with sweat, and every time I blink, I see the world through a prism of blood. Then another kid falls, and Ruan bends over his bleeding head and asks, why us, though? If they're so good at killing, he says, then why don't they do it themselves? I tell him this isn't so much killing as it is cleaning up a mess. These kids, all of them, they're already dead. Sissy says it's eerie, and we both ask her, what is? She says gunshots with no sirens. Then Ruan and I look up at her through the sound of the day's rising traffic. Sissy opens her mouth again, as if to say something further. But when her lips close in silence, I wake up in the bathroom at work. Sissy finds half a pack of tramadol on her top shelf. She's kept it in an old Horlicks tin above the kitchen counter, saving it for a day like today. We split the pills over, the glass, over her glass coffee table. Then, while passing around a glass of water, Sissy gets a text message from Julian. It's about a protest party at his flat off Long Street. We take what's left of the pills. Outside, the sky has grown dark again, thick and almost leaden in texture. To the north, columns of rain emerge from the hills that once came together, more than a million years ago, to create the crest and saddle of Devil's Peak. We smoke another cigarette with the painkillers, then we wait for a taxi out on the main road. I get the feeling, as we do, that the sky could drop down on us at any moment. Thankfully, the trip doesn't take long. The sky shows no interest in us, and we arrive with Julian's an hour later. Standing across the road from his place, 
I realize that my hours have become something foreign to me, that they've taken on a pattern I can no longer predict. Looking out over the cobblestones on Green Market Square, each orb cut from a slab of industrial granite, connecting the cafes on the right with the Methodist mission on Long Market, where hawkers and traders from different sectors of the continent erect stalls and barter the impressions of Africa. I feel my thoughts branch out and scatter, grow as uncountable as the cobblestones beneath us, as if each thought were tied to every molecule that comprises me, each atom as it moves along its random course. Ruan waves to the security guard. I ring Julian's intercom and we get buzzed to the 11th floor. On our way up, we stand apart, the mirrors in the lift reflecting the fluorescent lights. We remain quiet, facing ourselves as our bodies get hauled through thick layers of concrete. I lean against the lift wall and think of Green Market Square again, and how, not too far from here, and less than 200 years ago, beneath the white shadow of the muted Khruta Garg, slaves were bought and sold on what became a wide slab of asphalt, a strip divided by red brick islands and flanked by parking bays, where drivers are charged by the hour. Behind them, yesteryear's slave cells, which are now Art Deco hotels and fast food outlets. I think of how, despite all of this, on an architect's blueprint, the three of us would appear only as tiny icons inside the square of the lift shaft, each of us suspended in an expanse of concrete. Then the lift doors open. Sometime during the night, I think of my late brother. There were summers I'd take Lutanda down to the block in my old neighborhood, Mtata, to a big white stippled house at the corner of Orchid and Aloe Streets, where an Afrikaans family from Bloemfontein had moved in. Their son, Verna, who was older than us by a few years, had taken control of his family's pool house, a flat at least twice the size of my room. Verna liked to make us watch him while he squeezed the tube of dirty condensed milk down his throat, and sometimes he'd command my brother and I to laugh with open mouths through his fart jokes, after which he'd collapse into a castle made from his bright plush toys. We always met Verna at the window of his room. He was an only child and coddled by both of his parents. Since moving into the neighborhood, his parents had banned him from leaving his yard and LT and I had to jump the fence to register his presence. I suppose he was spoiled in retrospect, almost to the point of seeming soft in the head. As a teen, his teeth had started to decay, turning brown in the center of his lower jaw, but he was also big boned and well stocked and would often bribe us over to his home with ice lollies and video games. I had my own video games by then, but not as many as Verna. My mother was still new at her government job, and I couldn't show off in the way I wanted to about living in town. Lately, Lutando had started thinking he was better off than me. My brother had grown a patch of pubic hair the previous summer, and I wanted to remind him that he still ate sandwiches with pig fat at his house. And then one evening in Gangelizwe, his mother had served us cups of samp water for supper. Still, we hid together that day. Like always, Verna told us his parents didn't allow Africans into their house. He called us blacks, to which we nodded, and then he threw the controllers through his burglar bars like bones on a leash. My brother and I scuttled after them on our bare and calloused feet. If Verna didn't win a game, he'd switch the console off and turn into an image of his father, barking us back onto the tar like a disgruntled manier at the store, his face twisting as fierce as a boar's, fanning out a spray of saliva. When he did win, when Verna felt he'd won enough, he'd say his parents were due home in the next few minutes. Then he'd hoist the controllers back up and wipe them down with a wad of toilet paper. It was the same toilet paper he used to wipe semen off his plush toys, Lutanda would later say to me. He's a pig, your bullet friend, he'd say. I've seen tissues of it all over his bedspread. That day, Werner's parents came home for a long weekend, and he hid us behind a sparse rose bush growing against the newly built fence. 
The day was gray, like most of them that summer, but the bricks in the wall were still warm. My brother and I were caught not 30 seconds later. Maybe Verna wanted us to be caught. The maid watched us with a blank mask from the kitchen sink while Verna's mother lost the blood in her face. And his father, a large, balding architect with sleek black hair around a hard, shimmering pate, came after us with a roar, waving his belt over his head and shouting, Eight! 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 We were only 12 years old, so we ran. Later, back home, Lutano found me in the kitchen and squeezed my nose between his thumbs from behind. We hadn't spoken since our escape from Verna's house, and I'd been making us coffee, watching as two of the neighborhood mutts mated lazily in the yard across from ours. My brother led me to a mirror and mashed my face into the cold pane. Lutano was in a rage, and he asked me if I liked looking that way, with my nose pinched and nearly broke the glass with my forehead. I struggled and elbowed him, and we both fell to the floor and fought. When he tired of pressing my face against the bathroom towel, and with my saliva pooling against my cheek on the floor, I asked him why he was hurting me, even though I knew the reason. Lutano said everything else about me was white, so why would I mind having a pinched nose on my face? Then he healed my cheek again, and I thought it was to spite him that I smiled at what he'd said, but I knew even then a part of me was charmed by it. Eventually, when he got up and started to walk away, I tried to spit on his heels, and then I called him poor for the first time in our lives. This was me and my brother Lutando. Masks, Rowan announces to us, dragging the word in a drawer through each syllable. Sissy and I watch him from the other side of her coffee table. We're inside the following day, just a minute after noon, and Ruan's voice sounds weak but determined. Just because some people wear a mask, he says, that doesn't mean they've done something wrong. Sissy and I nod. Ruan sits across from us, printing out three paper masks for us to use. It's been about 48 hours since we took the client's money, and now we're back at West Ridge Heights again watching as the sun slides itself past Sissy's living room windows, throwing its rays across Cape Town's countless bricks and bonnets. With the weary ghosts of Newland st still keeping vigil in the co comatose gardens, only now, according to Sissy, beginning to smell our wealth inside her cream-colored building, we pass around her kitchen scissors and knit together links of rubber bands and then we pull our paper sheets over our faces and turn into people more important than we are. I guess this is what we're doing instead of discussing the client, and instead of discussing Sylvia, Sissy's aunt, whose body gets flown out in a pine box to Joburg today. Sissy opens the biggest window in her living room and sighs. It's hot all over Cape Town today, she says. I nod. You can feel the heat bouncing off the walls, and sinking into the sectional couch. And when we get up and walk around the flat, we have everything off but our underwear. The way we drink also is by putting everything in into Sissy's freezer. As soon as we've finished one bottle, we replace it with a full bottle of something else. We've left multicolored stains all over the kitchen floor. In the living room, Ruan passes me another bottle of champagne, and I take a deep swig. Then he stands up to tell us who he is today. I guess this is how it sometimes starts with us. We have these games we waste our lives on just like everyone else. And today, Ruan's up first, and he tells us we should call him the country of Zimbabwe. The way he's standing in front of me and Cecilia, we're both sitting still in the leather sectional, and we're looking at the Robert Mugabe skull pressed against his face. The gray printout hangs over his Adam's apple, a contrast to his wide, pale shoulders, and the way it's pulled back against his face, it looks like the beginning of a grimace, or like someone about to laugh. Then Ruan tells us he has 13 million people inside of him, and lying down, he's 400,000 square kilometers wide, and the way his pockets are set up, only 70% of his people live under the bread line. In response, Sissy and I clap for him. 
Then Sissy hands me the bottle of champagne and gets up from the couch in her white bra and boy shorts. She fixes Charles Taylor with rubber bands around her face and she tells us she's a hundred thousand square kilometers in size. Then she says she only has three million people living inside of her and that the way her pockets are set up, only 80% of them live under the bread line. When Sissy's done, she drops herself next to me on the sectional couch and I hand her the bottle of champagne. Then I get up in front of them for my turn at the game. I'm in my boxes with a picture of Joseph Kabila on my face. And what I tell my friends is that overall, I'm two million square kilometers in size. I tell them that I've got 60 million people living inside of me. And the way my pockets are set up, only 70% of them live under the bread line. Then Sissy reaches over and I take the champagne from her and sit back down. The three of us lie on the sofa and drink a while. What if we had more money than any of the people in those countries, Sissy says, or more money than their presidents? Ruan lights a filter and shakes his head. I don't know about the presidents, he says. Definitely not the presidents, I say. I get up for another bottle of champagne. Then Sissy says, what if? She says, you know, when people say the people, I always think presidents are what they mean when they say the people. Explain, Rowan says. I hand Sissy the bottle and she says, well, think about this. You remember about South Africa's first decade, right? From 1990. For years, South Africa was basically this one man. People used to call him Odata Wesizwe, the father of the nation. I tell Sissy Shaw, I remember this. Then she says, that's around the same time we were born, right? As citizens. She says, so we all shared a father in that sense, didn't we? Shared, Ruan says, what do you mean? Sissy laughs, okay, she says. I mean, sure, it's easy to dismiss the whole thing as some bullshit nationalism thing, isn't it? I get it, but that isn't my point. I think my point is more like, on a physical and cultural basis. We were all him, you know? We were all this one man from the island. Sissy asks if we understand her. I tell her that I think I do, or sometimes I think I do. Then I close my eyes and see myself back at the beach in Bloberg again. Falling back on the sectional couch, I watch as the ocean laps the quartz in the sand, the water rushing into Sissy's living room from every angle. From his side of the table, Ruan leans over his computer and his body divides into three bloodless sections. The light begins to intensify inside the living room, the industrial flushing its final hum through my blood vessels, and I watch Sissy for a long time as she nods. Then I get up to get more champagne for the three of us, and when I return, Sissy says we should all get one big house. Sitting on the section of couch, and with her head glowing like a child's crude, crude drawing of the sun, with each light ray pushing out of her head in a thick, flat vector, she says to me, let's grow to be more than two million square kilometers in size. I nod and close my eyes against the glare, and for a long time, as I hear Sissy's voice expanding inside my head, the feeling I get sitting here on her living room floor isn't about my uncle or Danun, it isn't about my sickness or my job. Instead, it's about the three of us sitting together in her flat in Newlands. The three of us knitting our fingers together, me, Ruan, and Cecilia, closing our eyes and becoming one big house. Thank you.